once again to the video. Continuing uh, my look at every uh, Formula One Grand Prix in the 2024 Formula One season. Now a couple of days ago, I, um, two or three days ago, well actually more than that now I think, four or five days ago, I did point out that I wouldn't actually be watching the Dutch Grand Prix live. I would, I would instead be watching it a couple of days later, and I have indeed just finished, finished watching it. Um, having managed to avoid the result. Um, so it's Tuesday, late Tuesday evening right now, and I shall uh, release the video on Wednesday. So, I haven't been able to watch as much of the race weekend as I normally do. Um, I watched a bit of practice, then I watched most of qualifying, and then I've just watched the race, but I haven't watched any um, pre-race build-up or post-race chit-chat. So there might be some details that I'd, I've missed out on. For instance, I never saw Sergeant's crash. I know that he had a big crash at, um, in practice. <clears throat> was it in practice? I think it was. It all him out of qualifying. Um, he took part in the race in Albon. I know was disqualified from qualifying due to uh, some issue with the underside of his car. The plank under the car was too close to the ground, I believe. Anyway, there are undoubtedly some details that I haven't uh, picked up on from the race weekend. But anyway, let's do what we normally do, which is listing down the finishing order then the top 10 in the Drivers' Championship, then the rundown of the Constructors' Championship. As you can see, we are being joined today by Lando Norris's um, McLaren, his MCL 60 uh, from 2023, specifically the 2023 British Grand Prix. Right. So, uh, what was it? It was round 15. Netherlands. Okay, so uh, let's go for it. I had the car in focus before. Oops. Now I need to make sure that the writing is in focus. Okay. Fourth was third piastri. Okay. 
this has to focus. So, Constructors Championship. First things first, uh, that race was, well, hang on, let's just put down fastest lap. Lando Norris on the last lap. Also, I want to put a little line here um, to indicate who is still left in the championship. Um, I'm not sure who is over here, but um, I assume it, it mathematically well, mathematically, of course, um, 43 points from one race. There's nine races left. That's about 390 odd points, isn't it? Uh, uh, plus fastest laps, plus sprint races. Well, pretty much all of them are still in it. <laughs> mathematically, maybe the top five are still in it. But here, it's definitely only these nine that are still in the championships. That red line will gradually move up as um, more and more drivers are knocked out. Now, that was not a particularly exciting race, I have to say. A uh, great result from my point of view and probably from any neutral perspective as well. Um, but it, it wasn't an exciting race, but the repercussions of the race are potentially exciting, and that is the fact that um, we could have a tight championship finish. Um, I will uh, say that probably I think I think everybody would say that it's most likely that Verstappen will still win the championship, but I reckon he'll win it by um, say 30 points, 25, 30 points. I think it will come down to that. Certainly if Verstappen finishes second in all nine remaining races uh, and Norris wins all nine remaining races, then Verstappen will still win the championship. Um, even if the sprint races that are remaining, uh, Norris wins and Verstappen is second. Um, it wouldn't be a big margin, but I think he'll still win by like six or seven points. So imagine that. Imagine if Norris won the last 10 races in the championship and still lost the championship. Uh, that'd be incredible, wouldn't it? Uh, much, much greater than when Lewis Hamilton won the last four races of 2016, but still lost the championship. So 
basically that race. I've written a few notes. Of course, pole position was Norris. Hamilton started on softs. Everybody else of the main runners at the top was on mediums. Uh, it didn't really work for Hamilton, though. He had a tough time all, uh, all throughout that stint on softs. He then went on onto hards, blew the hards gradually over time. Um, and, and then went on to softs towards the end with, I think, 20 laps to go, as did his teammate Russell. Uh, and again, uh, they couldn't do anything on the softs. Well, Russell was not on softs. He was on mediums on the first stint. But uh, the uh, Mercedes couldn't do anything on the softs today. Um, after the race, Verstappen commented on how bad Hamilton had been on the mediums. When... Uh, Hamilton had not gone on the mediums at all. He just went softs, hards, softs, didn't he? I think that middle stint was definitely hards. Wasn't it? I'm sure it was. Um, but that probably means that Verstappen was unaware that Hamilton had started on softs and not mediums. Uh, anyway, once again, of course, Norris had a terrible start. As I've said before, uh, I reckon I could do 0-60 to quicker than him. Um, but uh, yeah, he, always bad starts, but always bad restarts as well, and always bad when he's just come out of the pits. It's not about just getting away from the start line for him, it's about getting back into the groove. He struggles to just get up to pace. And of course, on a Grand Prix start, you need to get up to pace straight away. And Pretty much when you come out of the pits, you have to be fast on your on your outlap. But he's just not good at that. He loses time and places all the time because of that. And then he has to fight his way through. Um, and of course, that's what happened again here. He only lost one place. but um, And his car was certainly good enough that um, he was able to fight past Verstappen. In the end, quite easily. But it took him a number of laps before he had... Uh, he was able to get up close to uh, Verstappen. Verstappen is clearly doing, clearly doing a very good job, as I've said before, in that Red Bull. Um, he's showing what a champion he is, basically, by still pulling out great results when really he shouldn't be. I mean, certainly his teammate Perez isn't. Um, I am surprised at how much quicker this year Norris is than Piastri. Yes, I know that Piastri could have won a couple more races this year, but those wins would have been because Norris was further back down the field or something had happened to Norris in some way. For out-and-out -out speed between the two of them, there's no comparison. Norris on race pace, once he's up to speed, once he's had a number of laps, to get going and to warm up. Norris is way quicker than Piastri. Off a start line or any kind of restart or out of the pits, Piastri is quicker than Norris. But as time goes by, as the laps go by, Norris gets quicker and quicker. Maybe he's just easier on his tyres, I don't know. But he's, um, race pace, you, was, you would always pick Norris over Piastri, which is so surprising considering how how good we know Piastri is. Um, uh, what do you think of that new camera on the McLaren? Uh, it takes a little bit of getting used to. It's on a little sort of uh, gimbal, isn't it? Um, I've, I've got a drone and it's, um, it seems to be similar, that, uh, similar to that, basically on a little gimbal that stays stationary uh, as the car moves. It's, it's interesting. Um, uh, I think I, I prefer the camera to not be uh, on a gimbal, but um, it's okay. I don't mind it on say one team is okay. Um, uh, once again, Max was um, complaining about his car not being able to drive round corners. I think it was one specific corner, wasn't it? Round uh, uh, turn nine, I think, was it? Um, 
and he said it won't drive round turn nine or something going. Obviously it did. Uh, he's exaggerating once again. <laughs> um, but uh, the car can't be as bad as he says. It came second. I know that Max Verstappen is very good and sort of flatters the car sometimes to a certain extent. But if the car was particularly bad, he still wouldn't be able to come second, however good he is. So it's not a bad car. It's just not a totally dominant car. Um, that's all. So, yeah, not a particularly interesting race. Um, I thought Leclerc did very, very well. Uh, both Ferraris did well. Um, but Leclerc was, was a, did a solid drive from sixth up to third, was super quick. Um, and he managed to comfortably beat, managed to comfortably hold off uh, Piastri at the end, who was who was on fire, um, but uh, Leclerc managed to hold Piastri off uh, quite easily. That was a good result, and you could tell afterwards that Leclerc was happy with that. Is that his second podium on the trot? I'm not sure, but anyway, he's um, that was a very solid performance by Leclerc in a Ferrari that has struggled uh, ever since all the teams started releasing their upgrades because Ferrari's upgrade, which I think was released in Spain, uh, was not particularly good. Uh, yeah, I mentioned the um, Mercedes. They tried to go on to uh, softs for, they tried to do a two-stopper basically and went on, back onto softs, but just couldn't cut through the field at all. So a very slow, disappointing day for uh, Mercedes. As I say, I haven't seen any of the post-race interviews, so I'm not sure what Toto Wolff's uh, mood will be like, but it, I suspect he'll be quite abrupt um, and saying it's not, a, it's not a good enough team effort, um, all, that, all that sort of thing, because it's a very disappointing result for them. Um, Gasly. That's good for their new uh, team boss. What's his name again? Um, Ollie. Something Ollie. I should. Uh, or Ollie something. I shouldn't forget, but it, because as I said in a recent video, I'm I've been aware of that name for some time because. Um, because he is Deegan Fairclough's uh, sort of team boss in F four. Um, and uh, or was and I have a connection to Deegan Fairclough I know his grandmother basically um, I've never met Deegan never met him um, but I uh, know his grandmother so I've known of of Deegan Fairclough since he first started um, go-karting when he was about five years old he's very good in British F4 leading the championship by miles um, yeah, watch all his races. Uh, he's very good. Could be in F3 next year. Anyway, um, so yeah, I'm very pleased for the new uh, Alpine boss that straight away um, one of their drivers was able to score points. Ocon's not doing anything these days. He's Ever since losing his drive, he's just fallen completely off, off the pace, unfortunately. And we've got Mick Doohan, haven't we, joining Alpine next year. That should be good. Just need to get Liam Lawson in there. As well, I think they also will be fantastic. What team would he go into though? Uh, what team would he go into? Probably, probably Sauber, I guess. Oh dear. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, Sauber. Who knows? They might be good next year. Uh, we just don't know, do we? I loved it when, um, uh, when, uh, Martin Brundle during the race. I love his little catchphrases that Martin Brundle has. And he said that, um, uh, what did he say? Oh yeah, he said that uh, Norris, will, when Norris was coming up to overtake Max, he said, oh, he'll have to watch out for Max's rear. He'll have to treat Max's rear like the hind legs of a donkey. <laughs> and it's true. I mean, you come up close to the, the rear end of, of Max and you're gonna get kicked in the teeth. As has happened to Norris. Um, uh, at least once. Verstappen, very good driver, very aggressive driver. So you have to watch out for him when you come up behind him. 
Uh, but I love that line. That's fantastic. It's such a such a good line. Um, the Aston Martins Stroll has been a lot closer to Alonso of late. Stroll only, um, I think he was going to be eleventh in this race, but he got a five second penalty. Was it um, for speeding in the pit lane? That knocked him down to thirteenth. But Stroll has been on a par with Alonso. I don't know if that's Stroll improving or probably more likely Alonso losing his mojo because the car is not as good this year. So Alonso, uh, his motivation is not as great. And because of his age, his motivation has to be high in order for him to be able to perform, I should think. So uh, I think Alonso is, has just drifted down to Stroll's level. Um, but still good. Still good to see for Stroll. He's still holding on to 10th in the championship. Um, good old Perez. He's uh, he's not last of the eight top runners from the four top teams. He's not in eighth place. He's seventh. But that's only because Russell was disqualified from the Belgian Grand Prix. Otherwise, Perez would be last out of the eight runners. So Perez is not doing a good job. He qualified fifth. He finished sixth. Still not good enough, but they've committed now and said they're going to keep him definitely to the end of the year. I think just to keep Max happy. Max likes having Perez there because he knows he can comfortably beat him. But unfortunately, that also means that because because Max can comfortably beat Perez, Perez is no is not near enough to be a rear gunner, basically. Um we just need Piastri to get up there. So unfortunate that with the Dom McLaren so dominant in this Grand Prix, Piastri wasn't able to get up there for second place. Take a few more points off for Stappen. That's that's frustrating. Uh, very frustrating. What are these notes I left? Oh yeah, um, something I noticed is that, that McLaren have outscored Red Bull in eight of the last nine race weekends. Uh, the one they didn't was Spain. Now interestingly uh, the race just before those nine race weekends was Miami but despite Norris winning Verstappen uh, Red Bull and I think Verstappen scored more points because that was a sprint weekend wasn't it I believe. Uh, and McLaren were actually outscored, as I believe Norris was, by Verstappen. And that can't be, but that's amazing. Eight of the last nine race weekends, McLaren have outscored Red Bull. It's incredible how quickly, um, how quickly that's happened. Twenty-two seconds. That's the twenty-two, twenty-three seconds. The winning margin for Norris. That's the largest winning margin this year, um, which is quite something considering the dominant races that Verstappen had at the start of the uh, start of the year. It's also the fourth race this year that there have not been any retirements, uh, which I also found very surprising. Um, that's the most ever. I think that's what I found surprising. It's the most ever. I th I was sure in the last over the last sort of ten years that there have been seasons where there have been more than four races without retirements, but apparently not. Um, now, when I was younger, in the eighties and the nineties, uh, especially in the eighties, you were lucky if half the field finished. Uh, it, it would often be. There were 26 runners back in those days, most years, 26 cars on the grid, and you would get, say, 10 of them finishing the race. Um, which is very frustrating, <laughs> not just for the viewers, of course, but for obviously for the participants, too. Um, it's great that that doesn't happen now, but because the reliability is so good now, I'd have thought that there would have been more than just four races in recent years. Uh, what else to say about some of these drivers? Science, yeah, that was a solid performance. Um, 
Hulkenberg, well, he tried to go about 150 laps on one set of tyres, um, hard set of tyres, and only just lost out on points because of that. Ricardo, was he was he actually in the race? Uh, well, I guess he was, because he's classified 12th. So he had another race where he's been pretty invisible. Um, so I can't really talk about him. Albon, well, Albon started right at the back, as did Sargent. I mean, they in a way, they did well to come through 14th and 15th. Especially Sargent. I mean, he, that's a dizzy height for Sargent to finish uh, 16th place. Um, Magnussen went off the track early on, didn't he? But um, came back on. Bottas and Joe, those Saubers, dearie me. Um, and they were... They, I noticed that they only completed 70 laps each. Everybody else above either completed 71 or 72. They were the only two drivers, two laps behind the winner. Um, I don't recall seeing them having problems in the, in the pits. Maybe they did and I missed it. But anyway, it's terrible for Samba. Look at this, look. Oh, my word. Red Bull and McLaren. McLaren are going to win the Constructors' Championship this year. That's fantastic. It's the first time they've won since... Well, it would, it would be the first time they've won since uh, 1998. God, dear. With um, Hakkinen and uh, Coulthard. Uh, yes, I remember that, that year well. That was complete domination. Not complete domination, actually. Um, but it was... Quite a strong domination by McLaren, especially Hakkinen. Um, and what was the other thing? Oh yeah, McLaren's win at the Dutch Grand Prix was the first McLaren win at the Dutch Grand Prix since 1985. Of course, there were no uh, Dutch Grand Prix between 86, um, well, between 85 and 2021 when they started again. But I remember the 85 Dutch Grand Prix and it was the last win by uh, Nicky Lauda in a very lacklustre year for Nicky, La Nicky Lauda. It was his last year in Formula One. He had won the championship in 1984 beating teammate Alan Prost by half a point which to this day is still the closest winning margin in the championship. Half a point. There were some half points because of Monaco that year which was a wet race, and Alan Prost scored four and a half points for winning it instead of nine. A race that would no doubt have been won by Senna in the Tolman, his first ever win, had the race gone full distance instead of being stopped for the rain. Uh, oh, and as I've said before, I'm, I'm drifting off topic a little bit, but Prost would have scored sec six points for second place in that race. Instead, if it had gone the distance, instead they stopped it early, some would say because Alan Prost was French. I don't necessarily think that. But because he got half points, because only half the race had won, had been run, uh, he got four and a half points. So he actually got less, one and a half points less than he would have got had he finished second to Senna. Um, and he only lost the championship by half a point that year. So um, there you go, make of that what you will. But anyway, the following year in 1985, Nicky Lauda had a very lacklustre defence of his world title. He had clearly just given up and didn't have the uh, didn't have the drive um, or the motivation anymore. And but he did win one race, and that was the Dutch Grand Prix 1985. And then the next Dutch Grand Prix win was 2021. That was the next Dutch Grand Prix. 2021 with uh, Max Verstappen winning three races on the trot. Anyway, I drifted. I drifted back in time there a bit too much, probably. Um, but anyway, there you go. So I can't really say any more about this race, I'm afraid. One, uh, one comment on my channel uh, just after the race did actually say um, that it was 
a bit of a flat, I can't remember the exact words, but it was a bit of a flat race, not particularly exciting. Uh, and that's true. It wasn't an exciting race. It was a big winning margin. It wasn't an exciting race, but the result is exciting. So let's see what happens from now on. 70 points. Between Verstappen and Norris. But all it will take probably is Verstappen to win one, maybe even just two races out of the remaining nine, and that will secure him the championship. Norris has to pretty much beat Verstappen in every race or rely on a retirement from Verstappen, which you don't want to see. You, want, you don't want championships to be decided on retirements. So there you have it. Uh, sorry, this video is a little bit late. I normally release them on Mondays, but I couldn't this time, of course. So, thank you for watching. Thank you for listening. Uh, if you'd like to subscribe, please do so. Or comment on the video, or like the video, or even leave a tip on the uh, thanks button below the video. And I will see you on the very next video. Um, which will uh, not be about Formula One. But then only a few days later, there will be the review on next Monday on the Italian Grand Prix. So I'm looking forward to that. This could be a very exciting championship rundown. Let's wait and see. Oh, also, I just wanted to comment how great it was to see all the Dutch fans, for starters, not leaving the circuit. Um, Ferrari fans tend to leave the circuit if, if they know that their driver's not, the Ferrari is not going to do well in the race. Uh, they will often leave in their droves, not all of them, but a lot of them. But I couldn't see any of the Dutch fans doing that. And they all cheered Norris at the end, probably because Verstappen is Norris's mate. Um... Plus, they both share a Belgian parent, don't they? So uh, those connections, I think, are helping them cheer on Norris. However, if Norris was to win the next few races, uh, the Dutch fans might not be cheering him quite so much. Anyway, still good to see. Um, so thank you for watching. Thank you for listening. And until next time, goodbye.